This week on the Eldritch Lawcast, we discover whether the best Paizo published adventure is actually a D&D 5e module. All that and more right now. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the number one podcast in all the planes. That's right, the Fae Queen decided that encroaching civilization was worth it if it came with the Eldritch Lawcast. My name is Ben Byrne and I'm here as always with Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin and James Hake. James, I have to ask, if you had a hobby, let's have a getting to know you sort of moment. If you had a hobby that wasn't d and D5E, that's something that uh, you really, really enjoy, something that when people ask what your hobby is, as I am doing right now, you enjoy sharing it with them, what would that be? I love how you say if, as if this is some sort of hypothetical question. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't have any, but if a gun to my head, I had to pick another one. <laughs> if you yeah, had exactly. to enjoy something that wasn't related to work. I had to enjoy something else, it would have to be the cultivation of my beautiful little, my beautiful <gasps> little plants. Yeah, fair. If I could twist my webcam and, you know, mess up the sight lines for a little while, I would show you all of the ah, lovely little boys that are not just you know, backdrop behind me, but also off and in the corner and devouring my kitchen table and all of that. <laughs> I have gone a little plant crazy over quarantine, which I I think is delightful. Mm. Uh, I love seeing them grow and, uh, and I get a little bit stressed out when they wilt, but then bring them back to life. I mean, it, it really is a lovely little diversion. Uh, something that that I can be in control over a little bit uh, when life seems out of control. Uh, are you a green thumb or do you find that you struggle to keep them going? No, you know, I've heard many people say that they have a hard time uh, keeping plants alive. They've got a brown thumb, but uh, I, I guess I've been blessed with good plant luck. I did my research. I uh, have a decent house for them and I've had friends uh, who have been very kind enough to send me little cuttings of plants. So I haven't spent well, I have spent hundreds of dollars at plant stores, but <laughs> I didn't have to. And that's the point. You made a choice to spend I, that money. <laughs> I did because I wanted to, damn it. <laughs> I think you I said this last week, I think off air, but if you went back to the first episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, assuming it's the same plant, you could probably do a super cut, James, of your background and watch the, the glorious plant behind you just grow bigger and bigger. I've just started noticing it the <laughs> past couple of weeks. Yeah, I've, I've been noticing that it's almost like little cat ears above my yeah. head sometimes, depending <laughs> on the ankle. Sean Merwin, if I hypothetically put a gun to your head, we'd turn a phrase to repeat that and ask you what your non-D&D specific hobbies were. What would you say? Well, it sounds like it should be self-defense with all the guns being pointed at my head. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, touche. I have two hobbies that if I could do more, I would. I do them a bit. One is golf. Uh, I, I like getting outside. I like sports. Uh, but as the lung capacity decreases, uh, the physical activity that can be done uh, has to compensate. So golf is a good way to do that. The second is poker. Uh, I love games, and right. poker is one of those games that you, know, you you can become good at it, but it's still luck. So I asked a professional, you know, how much is luck and how much is skill, and and he wisely said it's ninety percent luck and ninety percent skill. Games <laughs> like that really. <laughs> really uh attract me yeah okay are you a fan of like i don't know if you've ever played like the sheriff of nottingham uh which is like a bluffing style game or those sort of games is it the fact that you're kind of playing mind games with somebody else to try figure out whether they're bluffing or not that you really enjoy about it yeah there's that psychological aspect to it the the just the the observation of the human condition is <laughs> sure. fun. so yes love sheriff of nottingham uh very much now, enough about legacy media like poker. Let's talk okay. about Sheriff of Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I have to leave. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't call back to previous episodes. Like, we can't get in that habit. <laughs> yeah, just Dangerous yeah, every, habit. But it is your hobby. <laughs> every episode of the Eldritch Lawcast is somebody else's first episode. So we've got to do the little, everybody gets their little paragraph of text. Um, <laughs> Previously on the Eldritch yeah. Lawcast. <laughs> oh, we should start doing that. If you look at the analytics, 
analytics for the last episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, where Sean says legacy person, you can see it go <laughs> this many people are watching, this many people are boop, and it goes like up to here and then back Good down job. again. It's quite funny. <laughs> Dale, let me say under <laughs> duress rather than specifics. Um, and I don't know why this, this uh, question has become so hostile this week, but if you had a see, hobby outside of 5e, what would it be? See, he's not pointing the gun at my head because he knows to fear me. I would have to say... Um, I, it's weird because at first when you asked the question, I was like, I don't have any hobbies. And I just kind of forgot that things like writing and drawing are hobbies. Yeah. Um, but I draw stuff and I write stuff. So I, I suppose those are, those are non D&D hobbies. Oh, I write fan fiction. Let's not get into it. Let's um, not be ashamed of that. Yeah. You were the one who said, like, let's not, let's Just, deconstruct the word true. cringe. It's true. So. It's true. I, I actually have a whole uh, guest lecture I've done for the University of Wollongong where I talk about um, things like fan fiction. Fan fiction is my example of how digital media recreates um, oral sort of cultures of the past. Mm. Uh, it's a good lecture. I'm just saying. But uh, I'm not ashamed of my fan fiction, but like it will get into the guts of like why do i choose to write fan fiction for good witch the hallmark show about a good witch <laughs> so i mean let's i you know, I, I write some fan fiction but <laughs> let's talk about things i draw i like to draw i uh you know i i do little cartoons i do uh little landscapey things it's fun <laughs> Um, I think really, you know, playing any role playing game is fan fiction, right? Especially if you're playing within uh, a campaign setting that is not one that you've invented yourself. If you're playing in Grim Hollow or the Forgotten Realms or whatever it happens to be, it's all fan fiction. Fan fiction is great. Peso are publishing one of their Pathfinder uh, adventure paths as a 5e module. Uh, this is true. And if I recall correctly, I might be wrong about this, but it's not the first time they've done it. Oh. If I remember right, Scarlet Citadel, one of the most popular Paizo adventure pads, received the 5e treatment, oh, probably a year or two ago. Right. Okay. That's interesting. I wonder why it's caught on now as as being something that's, uh, I mean, maybe it caught on 12 months ago. I'm not sure. Uh, as something that's being newsworthy. But it, just, it, it struck me as really odd that... You know, Microsoft is publishing Halo on the PlayStation. Uh, white is black, black is white. Like this just seems like a very odd, not an odd business move, I suppose, but just like a, a an odd move. And it was funny in their press release because they referred to fifth edition or D&D not as the world's greatest role-playing game, but as the world's oldest role-playing game, which I don't know if that's <laughs> true, but that was an interesting uh, way of them sort of rewording themselves. Why it is so noteworthy now is because what, what uh, James is talking about was a Pathfinder Adventure Path. This is a Pathfinder 2 Adventure Path. So oh. why why it raises eyebrows mm -hmm. is it sounds like they are giving up. It, what it sounds like, not what's true, but what it sounds like is right. they're giving up on Pathfinder 2 and putting out mm. 5e content, which is not true. They are they're not giving admitting. up on 2e. <laughs> what's really noteworthy is the bad blood that has been airing between Paizo and Wizards over the course of the last few years, where at one point I would not have imagined that Paizo would have ever put out a product compatible with a Wizards of the Coast product, just because that would be admitting that anything that Wizards did was okay. Sure. Now, if they're trying to use the marketing copy to say, it's not the greatest, it's not even the most popular, even though everyone knows that it is, based on all mm. of the metrics that we see from the Or report and from play on uh, Roll20, play on Fantasy Grounds, the stores that report their play. You know, uh, Pathfinder 2 is not even as popular as Pathfinder by a good margin. Mm. So it's not surprising that they're putting out a 5e compatible product because they can make money by doing that without a lot of work. There will be some work, but not as much as if you were creating it from the ground up. Pathfinder 2, actually, I, I remember when I was kind of in the throes of 5e mania, this is probably three or four years ago, uh, the Pathfinder 2 playtest was coming out, and I recall being quite down on it. But recently, I've heard a lot of really good organic press about Pathfinder 2. I've heard a lot of people really lauding its combat system and saying they're having a tremendous amount of fun with it. Mm. And... Uh, 
uh, now that I'm a little bit less gaga googly eyes for fifth edition, I I think playing Pathfinder two sounds like a blast. <laughs> I think I would love to love to give that game a try. I love the phrase gaga googly eyes. Just, just <laughs> I just want that you know on the record. <laughs> you can adopt it into your lexicon too. You can say it any time. <laughs> no <shall>. royalties. <laughs> Just <laughs> making a note of that for the show notes. <laughs> James goes gaga googly eyes this week. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've talked a little bit about playing Pathfinder 2 in the office. I think, you know, uh, from what I've heard, I don't know this is a, as a fact, so I could be um, confirmed or denied here, but Pathfinder generally 1E or 2E sounds like it would actually be more my personal speed of role-playing game, A, because it's a bit crunchier and I have a wargaming background, and B, because it's not quite as A, hand wavy over certain things, which give the the party a level of power. And B, it's not quite so, like the power ramp up isn't quite so large. So it can still feel like a grittier game, even at higher levels. Dale, to my understanding, you started with Pathfinder before uh, you sure were playing did. D&D at all. Have you played 2E or or what, what separates Pathfinder from D&D in your eyes? I haven't played 2E, um, and I think weirdly part of that is that, you know, you learn Pathfinder and it's it's a somewhat complicated system, but, you know, you go, oh, this is exciting and new. At least for me, it was exciting and new because I had no other systems to work with at that time. Or I did, but I didn't know it. You know what I mean. Mm. Um, and so you absorb all that information and then 5E comes out and it's so much more simplified. And I was like, at first I was a little bit like turned my nose up at it. I was like, ha. Huh, of course. Ah, uh, you of are course. a Pathfinder it, fan. It hand, waves, it hand waves too many of the things, but then over time I realized that I, I've got all my notes scribbled in my Pathfinder core book that are like, please just find a way to get rid of all these floating modifiers so I don't have to remember them. Um, and so then, you know, you gradually shift over. I say you, I mean me. Every time I say you in this conversation, <laughs> I mean me. Um, I, I gradually shifted over to 5e, and then it got to the point where now it's like, ugh. The idea of trying to learn <laughs> Pathfinder again for for a second edition, because mm. I have no doubt that it will be um, extremely crunchy, even if they have streamlined streamlined some elements of it. Uh, the crunch is a lot of what makes Pathfinder feel like Pathfinder, because mm. it it really one of the the core thing that made me still hold on to Pathfinder rather than switching immediately over to 5e was um, the flexibility during character creation, especially in terms oh. of like, you know, where you can put your skill training and and look at this list of skills. It's so long. And, you know, you can, you can make up whatever background you want. So when I looked at 5e and it was like, here's your class and here's your background and you get to choose from this small list of, of this also short list of skills to be proficient in. To me, um, particularly starting more as a player than as a DM, that was like an affront. It was like, let me make the character I want to make. How dare you limit my background possibilities, which is of course not how 5e works, but I thought it was at the time. Um, oh. So it is, It is. I think um, that 2e must still be crunchy. I think that is a big important thing for Pathfinder to stay Pathfinder. And I wouldn't want them to change it, but uh, that's that's my explanation as to why I still haven't gone and learnt the Pathfinder 2e system. I also think it's really funny that Pathfinder was designed as a game that would not have a new edition coming out <laughs> ever. <laughs> I just think that's really funny. Well, you've got me wondering now as somebody, you know, we've had discussions on this podcast before about um, the ubiquitousness of 5e. I think that's the word I'm looking for. And uh, how there's, you know, a discourse within the fandom around role playing games in general about those who are very critical of the idea that 5e is the only role playing game you'll ever need. And if you want to play, if you want a different experience, a different genre, you need to change system. And those that are very much like, you know, I love my 5e, leave me alone. I don't really want to learn anything else. And of course, everybody who has varying opinions in different ways between those two kind of polls. My question is, as someone who's come from, and I'm interested in James and Sean's take on this as well, as someone who's come from a crunchy system to 5e and are now feeling to what I'm hearing it to be somewhat laborious to try to get back into Pathfinder 2e, does 5e train us away from crunchy systems because it hand waves so much and makes it so easy to get into the game. Ooh. It's just like, 
I can't be bothered. Like, it was the same with The Witcher. We don't play The Witcher role-playing game a lot because you need a flow chart to be able to make a single attack, which I think is great, but it's it's not sustainable for our gaming group because it's just like we just want to jump in and play, right? We don't want to have to go through the process of learning learning a new system. Does 5e train you to prefer 5e? In a, what a is that- fascinating allegation. I want to hear from <laughs> the people who publish 5e stuff. I can't say that it trains you to prefer the one thing, but it shows you the strengths of a game that can do these things. And if that satisfies your itch in gaming, then wonderful. If you like the story development and the mechanics to be sort of equal weight, then 5e sort of fits that bill. If you want a game where the mechanics can overwhelm the story, doesn't have to, but can, then you may want to crunch your game. If you want a very light mechanics where it emphasizes the storytelling, then go with you know Fate or Powered by the Apocalypse or a game like that. So I don't think it was done intentionally to train people to only like this sort of game. But I think coming as it did after 3rd edition, which is basically Pathfinder, and 4th edition, which is much different, uh, we need to... I, I said something and I knocked James's <laughs> microphone right over. That's how, that's how powerful my statement was. <laughs> uh, sorry, Sean, what were you saying? I have no idea. <laughs> 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 I'm sure Sean it was very her. erudite. Yeah. I think, uh, Sean, <laughs> um, I, I think that, that you're right on the money. Um, fifth edition is a very popular game uh, produced by a company with a lot of like reach and a lot of market share. And I think other than those things, it would be wrong to categorize 5e as somehow different from every other RPG out there insofar as uh, it's just a game with a lot of rules that it takes people a long time to learn and they get invested in the rules of the game. The Mm. game may encourage you to break the rules and customize it and stuff like that, but it's not going to change the fact that just like older editions of D&D or Pathfinder or, you know, Age of Sigmar or any other big a role-playing game people have a certain bias towards not throwing it all away and starting over again sure. learning a brand new system um i think for people like me who started playing a crunchier edition of D and then were kind of shown a uh a a more streamlined way of doing it like me or like dale or or, or hell like you sean or Ben, you started with 5e, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Sorry, you're not in this club. <laughs> <laughs> I started <laughs> wargaming and then... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely in it too. If, if, you've, if you've played a crunchy role-playing game and then played a slightly less one, you might now be uh, encouraged to examine your biases rather than just kind of going with the game that you learned how to play. Sure. If you enjoyed the more streamlined nature, you might then, after D&D fifth edition try out fate or you might even go harder and try rifts or something you've heard great things about how how intense the mechanics of that game can be and it really just comes down to what you've learned about yourself and and who you are as a gamer and then i feel like um there's a lot to be said for intuitiveness right so yes no matter what game you sit down and try to learn the system for it's an investment of having to actually read and understand those rules and then express them to your group if they're not familiar with them as well um and that's a lot of stuff no matter what game you you're you're, you know looking at playing um but where crunch has sort of a danger zone is in terms of intuitive play. Something like Fate is super easy to explain to new players because it works using a lot of things that we're familiar with from just other narrative storytelling, television or film um, or, you know, books. You know, you've got your high concept for the character and then they have these, you know, elements of, of you know, flaws and and whatever the other word is that... Aspects. Aspects. Thank you so much. Um, and those are things that can very easily be picked up by by your players or by you as the GM reading the rules because you've already got this sort of framework of understanding. But when you move to something 
like particularly a game in the same genre going from 5e to pathfinder they're both fantasy they have a lot of similar trappings and that genre framework actually won't help you very much <laughs> because mm. um the things that stay the same are like you have skills and you roll a 20-sided die and you add your you know bonus from other things um so the crunchy elements are not necessarily as uh, intuitive for someone to pick up and i think that that just means that um the investment isn't necessarily more but it feels heavier <laughs> We had an email, somebody was asking about this from uh, a listener, David. One thing they asked, do we expect other publishers that have done, like, are we expecting the Call of Cthulhu 5e uh, adventure to come from um, Chaosium or are we expecting the Vampire Masquerade 5th edition module? Like, do we think other companies might try to tap this market as well, given how popular it is? Pathfinder and D&D are cousins. They share a lot of the same DNA. That sort of jump is pretty easy to make conceptually. You can do eldritch horror of a kind in D&D, but you know, I mean, Call of Cthulhu exists for a reason mm. because its its system does things mechanically that encourage a different type of narrative than mm. D&D. I, I wouldn't say that Pathfinder's mechanics go out of their way to encourage a different kind of narrative than D&D does. There, there may be different flavors or nuances, but sure. they're, they're still pretty close. I mean, if you play this adventure, which is called uh, Abomination Vaults, which seems like it's a big uh, mega dungeon crawl. You've got an evil sorcerer that you're trying to stop from rising again. It's all very familiar as a um, sort of D&D style adventure or fantasy role playing game adventure. But is there something about this that when you play it with the fifth edition rules, it will still feel Pathfinder? Will it feel like Galarian? Yeah. Well, I think the, the Galarian setting might be one of the main selling points. Uh, it, it's not the Forgotten Realms. It's Paizo's own kitchen sink fantasy setting, uh, which <laughs> if you're a big fan of Galarian, but you, I don't know, moved off of Pathfinder and started playing 5th edition, for example, you might be qu quite quite happy to come back to a setting you know and love and you know probably have a little bit of superiority inside of you for feeling is better than the forgotten realms you don't have like to that. learn a new pantheon of gods i mean actually that's a significant thing to mention so mm -hmm. in critical role campaign one let's not forget that pike the cleric's ah. god was saren ray who's a mm. who's a pathfinder setting god and i think that the pantheon of gods from pathfinder actually is a is a really big selling point the the setting mm. gods that you're handed in the core book because in in a way it to me, it reads as more accessible than um, the fifth edition sort of presented uh, gods, because although I do like the domain things, let's not get into it. It's all very complicated. But you know. <laughs> I gotta say, the third edition player's handbook did a great job of presenting <laughs> D&D's gods. I love what they did in the third edition player's handbook. I would believe that 100%. For me, it's, you know, I love the domain system, but then... I was, again, so used to Pathfinder. I was like, all right, where's the list of gods? And you get to the back and it's like, there's 12 different pantheons for you to look at. And most of them are real ones from our world. Yeah. And I was like, this is too much. Yeah. Um, but uh, I couldn't wrap my little head around it. I got there in the end. But um, I, there is something to be said for the, um, the Coke Pepsi situation here, right? So, you know, you've got D&D, &D, which is the big fish, which, you know, it, it cuts its way through the water. It gets all the people to start playing RPGs, right? It's Coke. Then you've got <laughs> Pathfinder as D&D's Pepsi. And their, their position allows them to be, they are such a similar product. The, what they can do, what they can afford to do is really to just like swim in the wake of D&D of &D and try to nab a couple of those people who've been converted, right? They yeah. can afford to publish a fifth edition adventure because some of those people who play that fifth edition adventure and do see these little, little piezo differences, they're going to go and they're going to be like, maybe we should try out Pathfinder. And even if they only get a couple of these people to come and, and swap over to, to Pathfinder in the end, you know, that's that's worth it in, from a marketing standpoint. They can do that. Sure. Whereas, uh, you know, something like Call of Cthulhu, that's a that's a different fish altogether. That's it's that's a whole a different right right there. <laughs> <laughs> and so you end up you end up with this thing where it's like if Call of Cthulhu made a fifth edition adventure, 
people might look at it and go, okay, well, it turns out that we can play that game using fifth edition. So why would we bother learning this new system? Mm. Um, I think the similarities that Pathfinder has to D&D in a way become a strength because it can afford to, to take little nips here and there. Sure. I keep sure. wondering if this makes OSR retro clones like RC Cola or something. <laughs> uh, no, what I'm really thinking is... Uh, in terms of video games, if I picked up The Elder Scrolls Online and it played exactly like World of Warcraft, I would be shocked. They're both MMOs. Uh, and so clearly they have a sort of shared genre heritage. But it 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 surprises me sometimes to go to Pathfinder 1 and see just how much of the DNA of 3.5 it shares. Um an even more wild example, I mean, that, that that tracks for this would be like if I were very, very used to playing Dragon Age mm. and then I went to go over and play. What's something radically different than Dragon Age? Cyberpunk 2077. That's a that's a great example. Yeah, if I were playing Dragon Age and I went over to play Cyberpunk <laughs> and they and they had more similarities than they had differences, I would be very, very surprised. I, I wouldn't want Cyberpunk to be running on a Dragon Age engine just because Dragon Age is the most popular RPG out there. Sure. I would expect a new company with a new game to make a new engine. And I think it's uh, obviously understanding the differences between video games and, and tabletop games a little surprising that we uh, that we expect other companies to present games to us in an engine that's familiar. Yeah. I understand why. Uh, we got to learn it ourselves instead of trusting a computer to do it. But it, but it is kind of surprising coming from that perspective. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's so much an expectation. I looked around to try to figure out if this was an April Fool's joke, <laughs> which I didn't think it was initially, but I just like, as I was putting the, the topics together for this episode, I was kind of like, wait, am I going to end up with egg on my face if I report this as like, yeah, this is happening. And then it turns out it's an April Fool's joke. I wouldn't have thought Pezo would have done this. Had you asked me, you know, two weeks ago, I would have thought it was just as alien as, um, you know, Chaosium or or anybody else kind of doing it. But that said, you've made very uh, salient points in terms of, you know, Pathfinder and D&D thematically kind of sitting in a very similar lane. Dungeons and Dragons Onslaught, a new board game, it seems like, or a skirmish game it's being billed as, um, uh, where two players face off. Um, I'm not quite sure what this is because on face value, it kind of reminds me of something like Warhammer Underworlds is what I think of when I think skirmish game, but kind of board game-esque where you have your um, little war band of dudes and you face off against an opponent. But there's talk about mechanics in this thing being, you know, you have a variety of scenarios that you have to accomplish and you can upgrade your units and you can find treasure and you have 12 characters that you have access to that you're upgrading, which sounds a lot more adventure-like than a typical skirmish game, which is typically, you know, sort of feels like a pitched battle. Um, is this something we're excited for? Do we like the D&D when D&D kind of uh, meanders into the board game space? I know they did a lot of board games. They did like Storm King's Thunder as a board game. I think they did a Ravenloft board game. I haven't played them, but I think something that is worth, it's, uh, it, we've got a nice like connection here to the, I think it was Pathfinder. I could be remembering completely wrongly, but I think that Pathfinder had a series of board games that basically acted as like a board game version of an, a, an adventure, a campaign that led you into playing the tabletop RPG. Oh, okay. I could be remembering this wrong, but I think it was Pathfinder. And they and you didn't have to; you could just play it as a board game. But like every game, sort of ran as a campaign, which is such a thing now. Legacy board games. Um, but uh, you know, you you sort of get to the end of the game, and it kind of leaves you this opening that if you wanted to, you could start your your heroes here. You could play the heroes that you played in the board game and gotcha. start playing the actual tabletop RPG. So it is a really interesting thing to do to try and access that sort of related hobby mm. of, of board game players, tabletop game players, and go, hey, you know what else you might like? Our other more popular product. Like, <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, that's how I got into D&D was starting with 
uh, I think I was playing Imp Star Wars Imperial Assault, which is similar to Descent, uh, Journeys in the Dark, which is fantasy flights games. And they were these sort of dungeon crawlers where you had a character and you could upgrade them and they took damage and you had a special abilities that only your character could do. Very sort of D&D feeling. And then I played actual D&D and I was like, oh, wow, these things are very different. Um, but it is a great sort of gateway going from board games into D&D. Um, &D. So having a, a board game that a could literally teach you. that you can follow. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and having a board game that tutorializes like 5e or Pathfinder or whatever it happens to be seems really cool to me. That's not what Onslaught is, but that seems like a really cool concept. Uh, a couple things. The Pathfinder had the, the Pathfinder adventure card game which I think is what okay. Dale is referring to. Uh, they hired My the Seattle favorite. company that, that uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, Lone Shark Games. Lone Shark. Uh, they, they created the game. <laughs> yes, L-O-N-E Shark uh, Games that um. they created. <laughs> that. And then they created a non-Pathfinder version of the game as well, if you enjoyed it but didn't want the Pathfinder trappings. Uh, they did sort of a haunted future game uh which i can't remember the name of but this isn't new for D D. Uh, D D had skirmish games going back to the game that created helped create the original D D, which was chainmail uh which which was a skirmish game uh i know at third edition uh they had the D D miniatures game which is a two-player or more uh D D skirmish game and with 4th edition in 2012, they came out with Dungeon Command, which was a two-player D&D skirmish game. You get a box that has your army, and you could, you know, had the cards and the minis, and you put together a certain number of points, put your army out, and you fought on a battle map against another player. So this isn't new. It is smart, uh, because as we're saying... If there are people out there playing skirmish games already and haven't quite gotten to D and D, if this works for them, we can pull them right into the game, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mentioned Warhammer Underworlds before as a game that I really enjoy and have been playing for a couple of years now, especially because it's a quick kind of hour and a half. Feels like a war game has a has that kind of flavor to it. But the thing that I always miss from it. And in fact, a couple of years ago when I was really deep into it, it was like, I'm going to work out my homebrew rules about how to turn this into a campaign game where I can upgrade things and have a storyline happening. And that Underworlds, I think it would be pretty difficult to do that with. At least I found it difficult when I started conceptualizing things out. But if this game has that sort of flavor where it feels like a compact, easy to play skirmish game, war game. It looks like it's played on a board from some of the photos that I've seen on it. So it doesn't seem like it's a full, you know, three-dimensional terrain game, which means it's probably more accessible. And that has a more campaign feel to it and a more storyline feel to it. Um, that would definitely gateway someone like me who hadn't discovered 5th edition yet into playing a, a, a role-playing game. Ben, I, you're, you're the Warhammer guy, not me, but my housemate has been... Uh, painting a Necromunda army lately. Okay. And from what I hear about Necromunda, there is some sort of precedence to a small squad, uh, semi-competitive campaign-based uh, uh, miniatures game uh, out there. Now, maybe you know as much about Necromunda as I do, which is not much. So <laughs> I I don't know, but it, it it sounds like it sounds like there there is a market for this kind of game. It sounds like there are people who might already be invested in this sort of play who would love to see it in a more sort of traditional high magic fantasy setting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, war games and um, role playing games kind of go very much hand in hand, as as Sean just mentioned, and. One thing that's always frustrated me about playing miniature war games, because I've played X-Wing and uh, at the moment I'm into Infinity, which has kind of been the re real rebirth of me getting into war ga a war game proper. But the thing that frustrates me is I'm not a tournament player. I don't, th there's kind of two types of war game players, which are folks that play it like it's a sport and it's like they're there to win and they want to solve the puzzle of the game and they want to construct their army with the right combination of dudes to be able to overwhelm the other side. And there's folks like me that play it more like almost a role-playing game where the more important uh, part of the game for me is 
in, I enjoy winning, absolutely no doubt, but the story that gets told through the yeah. course of the game. And so that has inevitably evolved into Necromunda and uh, Mordheim is sort of the fantasy version where the idea was instead of it being a massive army, it's like, I think, 12 dudes, which is what D&D Onslaught appears to be. And, uh, you know, you might have one central dude, three lieutenants and a, and a couple of uh, grunts. I think that's how Mordheim works. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Infinity, which is a skirmish game, although it's it's got the complexity and the scale of a full war game, but you only use sort of 10 to 15 miniatures, feels exactly like XCOM because it's like, all right, I'm going to perch this dude here. He's going to snipe Overwatch. This guy's going to try to sneak around there. Um, he's going to get shot at by the enemy because, uh, you know, you can react on your turn in Infinity. So, um and, and yeah, XCOM's a great example of that game that mixes that war game feeling in the video game space with a, a role playing game of making your dudes better um, as you level up and collect resources and those sort of things. Have you played uh, outside of XCOM any sort of skirmish games or anything like that, Dale? I mean, uh, I assume the Age of series counts to sure. some degree. <laughs> Uh, in terms of video game, like I, I feel like Age of Mythology, my brother playing Age of Mythology when I was a kid and me being that nagging little sister, just hanging at his elbow, being like, I want to play games with you. And he was like, no, I'm busy. I think that that led into a lot of my interests in terms of video games, mythology, any number of things. So, um, you know, I have my, my little bits and bobs here and there. It's not like my go-to, um, sort of video game genre but yep. I have enjoyed it every time I've played it. So I, I have long longed to create a, uh, a tabletop game that uh, taps into the same sort of strategic feeling that I get when I play Fire Emblem, um, yeah. where you have a deep connection to your individual units, but you're also making sort of uh, tactical decisions and seeing a story unfold as you play. Mm. Banner Saga uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's the... The one problem with doing that as a competitive war game, though, is because, like, with uh, I'm, I'm learning and playing Infinity with a friend of mine, and as we paint all our units, and we've got an unofficial rule between us at the moment, which is that we can't use unpainted units to try to make the battlefield as much of a cinematic diorama as possible and not have our little black and white metal guy uh, standing out in the middle of the field. But we've been naming all our units um, and giving them, you know, mild personalities. Odysseus is my long-range sniper because I know that Odysseus Odysseus is a tactician and, and an archer. Oh, yeah. um, the problem is your units die like every game and you almost, can't af uh, you almost can't avoid that in a war game because then you wouldn't be fighting each other. If, does that make sense? Um, so it, 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 it's interesting. I'm interested to see what you'd come up with, James, but it is a, it's definitely a, there's a challenge in game design there to making a, a repeat playable game where the other person's units are going to die. I played Dungeon Command because I got it free because I was working for Wizards. Uh, I'm not a collector. I don't <laughs> like to spend a great deal of money. So obviously, you know, all of those games where you're buying a lot of lead and painting it uh, is not out yeah. of my style. But I, I did enjoy just the game mechanics of it. And comparing it to a role playing game and what carried over and you know what lessons you could take from from it as a as a role playing experience, even though it's still competitive, a player versus a player. What were some of those lessons you think that you were able to take away at the time? It I, I don't I didn't learn a damn thing. I <laughs> I learned <laughs> yeah I I learned that you know the the resources that you have to tap into in terms of the game mechanics are can div can be uh, widely divergent from game to game as i looked at other games and so just seeing seeing the the ways that you could use those uh you know in in terms of the dungeon command i haven't played it in forever it's probably been 10 years uh, but as you succeeded, you could gain treasure and you could turn that treasure into new units. Uh, so it had sort of that uh, mechanic of not quite advancing uh, between games, but advancing right within the game itself to add one more thing that you had to guard against from your opponent. Uh, so, yeah, things like mm -hmm. that that you could use when you're designing an adventure uh, that 
oh, if the players find this, they can use it in the game. It just brings back that sort of game design, adventure design uh, mentality, looking at many different ways to do similar things. Have any of us ever had a campaign where you've had mass combat become a central part of that campaign, whether it's like a big war or something like that, seeing a lot of shaking heads at the moment? <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Man, I, I just know that it's not D&D's forte and there have been many, many yeah. attempts to get it right. Um, back when I was with D&D Beyond, I wrote an article uh, about mass combat, which essentially was find ways to avoid it. Uh, sure. If you have mass combat as a story beat, find ways to avoid having to deal with the tactical realities of a big battlefield situation. Mm. This is a small squad based uh, heroic game where uh, you want to be attacking strategic targets in a surgical strike. You, you mm -hmm. know, you're you want your allies to have griffins or chromatic or, or sorry, or metallic dragons that are dropping you off at strategic locations and going through a well-crafted uh set piece mm. and having a big story beat and something cinematic happen and then you're off i also read dm of the rings in a formative time for me as a DD &D player and uh every time there was you know a mass battle in the lord of the rings movies helms deep pelinor fields uh there would be wise cracks about how i think i rolled all the edges off my d20 by the end of that and we got like 50 xp for the thousands of orcs that we kill or something like that yeah like, okay i will never do this <laughs> Bad. see i i am so taken with the idea of making mass combat and cinematic sort of war pieces work within the D, D setting without literally just playing a war game on the side um and the 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 two sort of approaches to it that stick in my head i've never gotten to run it in a campaign but uh the two approaches that stick in my head are of course mcdm kingdoms of warfare uh which really tries hard to to make this sort of fairly intuitive uh mass combat system work and also, uh, the Dragon Age system has a, an inbuilt thing for, for mass combat. And both of those games, it is interesting to me, both of those games um, are designed to sort of happen at the same time as your squad of characters are doing a specific, like, mission. Yeah, you know sure. what I mean? Like, you five are taking on the huge big bad guy while this battle is happening. And you yeah. are controlling, like, units in that big battle, but ultimately you and your characters are focused here. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think that that instinct, I, I think the reason these two approaches to it stick with me is because that is a good instinct, because you, you really don't want to sort of drag D&D &D backwards <laughs> towards wargaming just because you will lose that you know personal this is my character and these are my choices kind of element to it which is really the central element of the game yeah i, I think you're both right the the one time where i've really had it happen again hasn't really been controlling like the army or at least not in a war game like way it's all right i'm gonna write up like how many battalions the enemy has and their special uh, npcs the big bad evil guy his lieutenants give them all the value and like one special skill write up all the resources the party has in terms of their allies their units that they have their phalanxes give them all the value ask the party where they want to send certain people this dude's like a, a master assassin npc that they know about so they can send him to go try and assassinate someone or they can go and try and do that thing themselves and put him in one of the phalanxes to run into into battle. And uh, depending on how they use the strengths and weaknesses of their um, of their resources, kind of creates a result of the battle semi off screen if that makes sense. So it's like, all right, you're all charging into. It was like a city siege, so they're all charging into the city. They didn't discover some vital piece of information that let them know the city had trebuchets on um, defense, which damaged their ability to really invade the city. But they did manage to get past the front gates. Now we're going to just run the combat of the party fighting in the city streets rather than like what's happening throughout every block of the city, so to speak. And I think it, w it went pretty well at capturing the chaos of war as well. When you don't have that top down godlike view, you put your plan into action 
and then you go and play your role and then at the end of it you learn what the result of all the other theatres of war were and uh, consolidate yourself and replan for the next day. Who did you lose? Who was successful at accomplishing what they accomplished? And what's the situation changed to be? Then they betrayed their allies and the whole thing went badly after that. Um, yeah, anyway. That sounds like D&D. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. We have an emailer question this week. If you want to email us uh, a topic to discuss, uh, you can reach us podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. You can also comment down below if you're listening to this on YouTube. We do pull those comments out from time to time. This email comes from Graham. Um, I have players that seem to expect adventure style play with things directly set in front of them. How would you encourage slash train your players to explore laterally to find goodies that you have sprinkled into the the world for them to find there's a bit of game design that we can borrow from uh metroidvania style design uh which is all about exploring and finding uh little goodies sometimes uh progression crucial sometimes completely optional off of the uh off of the sort of main path of bosses etc and the very first thing you can do is let them know that exploring is an option mm. uh, in Super Metroid, for example, uh, you start off by first off finding a bunch of locked doors until you find the right path and then you go down. Um, once you enter a certain area, this uh, eerie blue region with sort of glowing faces in the wall, uh, you'll find that there are simply passages that you can't explore without being able to curl up into a ball and roll underneath them. Um, and so you have to kind of backtrack and go out of your way, out of the clear and hidden path. You have to do a little bit of exploring to find the item that allows you to roll up into a ball and roll under low ceilings. Um, and so the game starts by making exploration to find goodies a part of the critical path. And then once they've taught you, this is something you'll have to do in this game. Uh, they feel free to sort of be more hands off with it and let the critical path kind of do what it needs to do while putting all of the, a bunch of fun goodies kind of hidden around in nooks and crannies, expecting you now to know that you can go exploring. It, it, it kind of ties back into kind of my, my number one a uh, bit of advice for D&D is, is communicate. You, you, you can't expect to sort of communicate entirely through game design winks, nudges, and innuendo uh, like a video game must uh, to let the players figure it out. You know, you're actual people all hanging out together. And it's entirely possible that, uh, you know, your players don't really want to do any of that. Uh, they Maybe they do just want more of a sort of guided tour through your your cool fantasy world to see all of the big set pieces you created for them and they don't really want to take up your precious game time that they only have a few hours of each week to do stuff that might be kind of fun and they might find a cool item and it might be a little bit more self-directed but what they really want are the big explosion set pieces and that's what they want to invest their time into uh, or they, hell, they might not have picked up on the hints they might not even know that exploration is really an option mm. and uh and so they don't do it. They, they just look for the thing that they've been, you know, subtly told to do, which is go for the critical path. If the question is more, there are these cool things like these spells from these splat books that I want them to want, then uh, then you just have to put it in front of them because they might not even know that such things exist. So if it's you want them to see these things and you want them to want these things, start by putting it in front of them. And then if they if they like it, if they say, oh, this spell is really cool, are there other spells outside of the player's handbook, then you've got their interest and they'd be more willing to go off and talk to the scroll master who happened to wander into town uh, mm. because then they know what their reward is going to be because you have given them that small taste. Uh more often I have the problem of I don't want my players going laterally because that's all they do <laughs> because they've read every single book and they want that plus four reality slayer that they read about in this magazine <laughs> that, you know, they only found you know, in the in the lavatory of the game store that uh, that they frequent. And how can they get that? Right. And I'm like, please just go fight the dragon. You don't need the plus four reality slayer. I've already given you a plus four dragon slayer. 
Uh, so you know, you know, more power to you if if your players just want to hear your great story. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it's it's one of those things that you, I mean, what a great benefit of tabletop RPGs that you can calibrate it on the fly. You can have a conversation with your players and you can tell them what you would like to see more of from them and they can tell you, oh, that's not really what we were looking for in this game. That is the the most powerful tool that you have in your tool bed. I, I do think that there is kind of a habit, an instinct for GMs to, to want to keep things as like secret surprise treats for your players. Yeah. Um, but I think that frequently those things can not go the way that you kind of envisage because um, because you really do need to communicate for things to happen. And actually, fun, this is, this is a study was done on spoilers and spoiler alerts. Um, even though you as a person might enjoy not knowing what's coming. I'm often like that. I don't want to know. I want to be surprised in, in the TV show I'm watching or whatever. But studies have been done that suggest that actually the enjoyment of whatever the twist is when you watch the show, it doesn't actually diminish just because you know it's coming ahead of time. Um, I don't know whether more recent studies have been done on that, but that's a study from a while ago that, uh, that I can sort of point to. But um, you know, I just think that that's a nice sort of safety net for GMs who are like, oh, but I want them to be surprised. They'll like it anyway, even if you tell them, hey, you know, wink, wink, go off to, if you maybe check out the site over here. Um, I do also want to mention, there's a, a, there's a technique in marketing that I think is really useful for um, exploration as a concept, right? Because exploration really for me, is driven by curiosity. That's the thing that you need people to be curious enough to explore, whether that be literally like the geography of a setting, whether that be like prying more into an NPC's backstory, any number of things. Exploration can be metaphorical or literal, but um, there's this marketing technique that is like the basis of all clickbait, which is that you want to create, <laughs> if you want to create curiosity, you have to create um, an information deficit. And what you do is you make a YouTube video with the title 10 things you didn't notice in the latest Spider-Man movie. And people, there's this drive to click on that because either you think, what did I not notice in that Spider-Man movie? And you go, I need to know, I want to know, so I'm going to click on that video. Or it can, it actually works double time because you might be like, I know so much about Spider-Man. I noticed every single Easter egg and you have to watch the video to prove it. You have <laughs> to watch the video in order to know what ah. they think that you missed. So you create this, this sort of area of not knowing something in someone's head and it makes them want to go and look at that thing. Um, and I think that's actually a really useful way of kind of tricking your players into exploring more. There's something to be said for reliability. Um, this is all very non-scientific, so sort of pseudo-scientific bit. Oh, yeah. But like, if you have a surprise that you know will generate a huge amount of excitement if it works, but you kind of understand that these surprises more often than not end up in disappointment for you because the players don't get it. Um, but you know that if you clearly signpost story beats to your players that you that you think are good, maybe not explosive, huge, surprising good, but good, uh, and that these story signposts have a very high success rate, you might actually make it out of, of your campaign uh, with a higher overall satisfaction by doing something reliably uh, without huge explosive results and variance than if you were kind of you're kind of trying to jj abrams a bunch of <laughs> or m night Shyamalan a bunch of uh, twists and surprises all on top of each other you, you have to be really really diligent about where you put those big twists because uh, not just it's not just that they'll get stale Having the rug pulled out from under you can get stale a bunch of the time. But also it's just that these twists don't always work the way you want them to. And you might just be better off by doing something uh, that's fine uh, a lot of the time and really bank it for your big twist later on. Also, train your players to recognize. <laughs> no, I was about to make a joke, but then I realized that it was going to be too long. But the joke, was, the basis was, you know, in video games where they'll be like, in Assassin's Creed, they always put like white fabric over the start of a good 
little free right, running yeah. trail, mm, yeah. you know, and you just learn to pick that out when you're on the run. You're like, oh, there, I can get up onto the rooftops. I was trying to figure out a way of doing that for D&D, but the joke oh, didn't come together quickly enough. I mean, you can, I reckon you could do something like that for D&D. I mean, just what I've learned from video games along these lines, and it's similar to what, James, you were saying um, initially around uh, Metro, I when I'm designing dungeons specifically, I like to think of them almost in a Zelda-like way for the to encourage the players to go and explore. They need the thing, the key that's in the other room to come back and unlock this door or activate this specific thing. And you need to be a little bit careful in doing that because you can end up with a linear path without realizing it. It's like, oh, you know, this central room has all these four rooms that go off of it. Well, you need to go to this room before you go to that room, before you go to the final room. And that's really just, you may as well have put the rooms in order. But, um, you know, putting things that they need can encourage exploration so that they look in other chambers and there might be something in another room that they don't need, but it's still, you know, something cool for them to, to discover. Ben, I beg you. Someday when we're not at the hour mark, will you set me off talking about Zelda Dungeons again? Just like mention this at the beginning of an episode one day. Sure, sure. The, the one other thing I just quickly wanted to mention outside of Dungeons is I've become fascinated with this concept of creating the open world like feel like Breath of the Wild or Horizon Zero Dawn or dare I say for a second time this episode, The Witcher, where you climb hey. to uh, the top of a hill and you look out and you can see to the horizon and then literally travel to that horizon, recreating that feeling um, of, of open exploration in D&D can be difficult because the players often can't see beyond what's immediately sort of in front of their characters unless it's described to them. Um, I, I did a video on it recently, but basically the the answer that I've come to at the moment is creating like a region map and kind of being like, see these mountains on the corner of this region map? You can go there and explore that, um, which has kind of become my, my way of giving them something visual to see that the world is open and they can kind of go in any direction that they want to, um, which is another way to try to encourage open world exploration as it were. Um, but James, salient as always, we are just about at uh, our hour mark. So that is unfortunately it for the Eldritch Lawcast this week. The Fay Queen wept uh, as the podcast came to a close. If you want to send us an email, give us a topic, something that we can talk about, uh, you can hit podcast at ghostfiregaming.com or comment down below if you're listening to this on YouTube. Um, the, our Twitter handles are also just below our names and they're also in the show notes if you're listening on an audio-only platform, if you want to jump in, have a conversation with us there instead. Um, uh, but otherwise, go out, spread the word, ring the bell, like orcs are invading your village and let everybody know that the Eldritch Lawcast will be back next week uh, as we are every week and we will see you all then. 